Hello, Sunshine. This is Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. Uh, let's see. This week, oh, we'll be talking analytics, Canadian style. Uh, we'll be talking the latest prodigy. Uh, we'll be talking She Believes and the U.S. Women's National Team, Mourinho, Tuchel, Pulisic, Morris, Milan, Champions League, La Liga, Arena, Bradley, Respect, Lady in the Dale, and so much more. But first, joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how are you doing on this Monday, February 22nd of the year 2021? I am doing well. I am in eager anticipation because we are 24 hours away from something that I've been looking forward to for a little while. What could that possibly be? Uh, tomorrow, a uh, Pele documentary drops on Netflix. Um, I've been reading reviews about it. Um, it. It sounds like it's not quite as compelling as the Maradona HBO doc, but it's supposed to be pretty good. An examination of Pele's career. Uh, looking forward to that. Also, by the way, March 1st, I know you won't be as interested in this, but Netflix also releasing a documentary on the notorious B.I.G. called I Got a Story to Tell, which is supposed to be pretty groundbreaking. Uh, they got Biggie's family to cooperate. So they have all this amazing footage behind the scenes, concerts and stuff that's never been seen. So looking forward to that. But uh, mostly the Pele one. I can't wait. Interesting. Well, I mean, if Maradona is going to do it, then Pele's got to do it, too. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see how it's hard for Pele to compete from a, a compelling entertainment standpoint. I mean, I'm not talking about the actual on the field type of stuff, but for the most part, he's been pretty angelic off the field. I guess anybody would be compared to uh, Diego Maradona. So it doesn't necessarily lend it lend itself, although I'll watch it. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. What do you know what that's on? You said that's on Netflix or Netflix? Yes. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Down in uh, Brazil, they call it Nejiflix. <laughs> I, I know that because during the uh, the Brazil World Cup, it was constant. They were pouring so much money in marketing. Netflix was down there and it would come on every radio and television station and you would hear Nejiflix. OK, uh, well, that's OK. So that's what uh, that's what you're excited about watching. Did you watch anything? Uh, anything that's uh, wor worthwhile? Uh, still that uh, same French show I mentioned last week, The Bureau. Um, I've just started the fifth and final season. Um, and yeah, it continues to be great. It's one of the best TV shows I've seen in a long time. Oh, my God. My wife had a bone to pick with you about one of those shows. Oh, yeah. So it's it's the French, it's the French show on uh, Amazon. Is that what you're talking about? The, the one, the one, one I'm on watching Amazon? now, yes. No, The Bureau. The Bureau. The Bureau, yes. It's it's on Amazon, but when you go, you can't you can't watch it. You have to pay for it. What the hell is that? I don't understand. I have Amazon Prime, but I can't pay for it. She was, oh man, you are lucky that you weren't around when that happened. Yeah, I guess it's technically on Sundance, but you can get it via Amazon Prime. Um, so I did one of those, uh, signed up for a free trial, and then I'll cancel at some point. But it <laughs> so it, it cost me like a grand total of like seven dollars to watch like. 50 great episodes of television, which uh, I happily did. But I, if your wife is unwilling to make that uh, investment, then <laughs> well, it was it was much more the work, I think, of having to do it. And you got to press the buttons and this and that. So. All right. But but she does listen to you. I swear to God, I don't think she listens to anything that I ever say, regardless if it's soccer or anything else. But she listens to you. You have become her go to source for the next big thing, not just the still watching stuff. my brilliant friend. Or? Yeah, she's watched all of that. She, I mean, no. you guys will have a great time uh, when we finally get together and uh, everybody can talk in a communal type of setting. All right. These are the things that I uh, that I watched over uh, over the last week. Uh, King of Staten Island. Uh, it's been around uh, for a while, starring Pete Dav uh, Davison, uh, Bill Burr, and Marissa Tomei. Uh, it was a whole lot better than I thought it was going to be. Um, interesting drama um, about this kid that, uh, not a kid, but a young man who doesn't have much of a direction going on over there in Staten Island and his backstory. And it's it's loosely based on Pete Davison's um, Backstory. So that's that's an interesting one. Uh, along the uh, true crime doc thing, uh, vanishing at uh, the Cecil uh, Hotel is not that good, um, but it's being promoted and it's out there. And obviously, it happened in our backyard over here in Los Angeles. For those that don't know the story, a, a young woman mysteriously uh, disappeared and then was found. And it's it's okay. It's it, the, the problem is is that the story on the surface is compelling, but then when you really get down to it, it's really not that much of a story, to be quite honest with you. Um, 
uh, it's in terms of retro stuff. My wife and I went back and watched uh, Wildcats. I don't know if you uh, remember this movie. It was in 1986, starred Goldie Hawn, a vehicle, for, another vehicle for Goldie Hawn, who was coming off Private Benjamin, and uh, starred, uh, as I said, Goldie Hawn, a young Wesley Snipes, and a young Woody Harrelson, all in it about this foot, this football team, this inner city football team that Goldie Hawn comes in and coaches. Uh, it holds up okay. It holds up okay. I had not. It, it wasn't one of my go-to movies back in the '80s, and so for me, it was better because I didn't know every line or or know every twist and turn. I'd seen it, but a long time ago. Um, uh, I also watched the movie Operation Finale about the uh, the capture of uh, notorious Nazi uh, Adolf Eichmann in Buenos Aires. Uh, it's been around for for a while that movie, but really well done, uh, and obviously a, a, you know a fascinating story about the Nazi hunters and how this particular um, capture and then transporting him out of the country occurred. And then Lady in the Dale. Um, this is a nutty documentary, by the way. Um, I, I recommend it, although it does go too long. It kind of goes off the rails at the end and kind of becomes something that I didn't think it was going to be. And I didn't think it necessarily needed to be. It was. It almost needs to be two different types of movies. But uh, the Dale was a car uh, that this um, that this woman uh, who ended up being an incredible con artist, a lifelong con artist, put out in the world and um, then absconded with, uh, <laughs> with money and was put in jail. It's a fascinating story, a story I didn't know about at all. Um, but the, the footage that they have of, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this woman and what she did, um, an amazing life uh, of of crime and deceit and and being a con, but also um, of a whole lot of other things. I do recommend it. It's uh, really, really good if you can uh, check that out. And I think that's on HBO. All right, Mossy, anything else before we light this candle? That's it. All right, let's get to it. Let's get to some soccer here, people. Um, what are we going to start out with? Oh, we got to start out with the U.S. Women's National Team. Okay, we came off of a, of a week last week where we were prepping for it. We had Ali Wagner on, the great Ali Wagner. Now we're two games in as we sit here speaking um, into She Believes. Two very, very interesting games. But, uh, you know, as the old saying goes, uh, you know, soccer is 90 minutes uh, and then Germany wins. Well, from a women's uh, national team perspective, it's 90 minutes of, of kicking the ball around and then uh, the U.S. women's national team wins. So they win. It's what they do. Uh, first game, they won ugly in a one nothing victory over... Uh, Canada, one of our major rivals. And then last night, uh, they uh, finished up for all intents and purposes the, and wrapped up the tournament because the third game is going to be against Argentina and they should, without a problem, beat Argentina. Uh, they beat up on, well, they didn't beat up on them, but uh, they beat your Brazil, Mossy, 2 nothing. Uh, it, it, it wasn't it, it, it wasn't a thorough and comprehensive type of performance in either game, to be quite honest with you, but they were also playing better competition. And I think for Vlatko Andonovsky, the uh, head coach of the U.S. women's national team, it gave him a lot to think about. And we were talking about this on air in that the U.S. national team is so good and so far better than most of the teams that they come up against that it's few and far between when he actually gets an opportunity where they struggle where they even at times fail. And I think in those moments, he learns more. And it's, and it's in a strange way more beneficial than any of the other games uh, that we have. So I think these two games, as far as data and case studies for him, are going to be incredibly beneficial as he tries to figure out what that ultimate 18 is going to be. Initial thoughts on these uh, two games, Mossy. Yeah, Brazil and Canada both occupy that sort of intermediate level where, as you mentioned, the U.S. plays a lot of games against teams like Colombia, where it's basically target practice, which is what we saw in those two friendlies in January. And then there are a few teams like France and Germany that are right at the same level. Uh, Canada and Brazil are sort of in that second tier where they're they're good teams and it's it's a real game, but still teams that if the U.S. plays well, they they beat nine times out of ten. And so they're, they're, they're good enough opponents to give you a bit more of a measuring stick, but not all the way facing a France or Germany. Uh, and, and we should also note all the teams in this tournament are missing some players due to injury or not getting released. Canada without Christine Sinclair and Jordan Heidema, Brazil without two starting midfielders and Luana and Formiga, the U.S. without Sam Mewis, Tobin Heath. Uh, but nevertheless, they all had strong enough squads that we can draw some conclusions. And yeah, I agree with you. They, 
these have not been overly impressive performances by the U.S. The really misleading part for me is the two shutouts because that paints this picture as if they've been rock solid at the back, and that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Both Canada and Brazil had some incredible scoring opportunities that they just uh, didn't capitalize on. Uh, the Katarina Macario hype train slowed down a little bit with her performance against Canada. It's only one game. I still think all signs point to her being a great player for the U.S. But so yeah, there are some things that uh, to work on. Some 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 negatives I would say from these two games, but, but overall the machine rolls on unbeaten in 36 games and, and, you know, it, it does, but you know, this, this competition within the competition, this competition for spots on the Olympic team, I think is really what's going to be interesting going forward is to see who those 18 are, as we said before, that music's going to stop and there's going to be some pretty high profile and big names and very talented players that don't have a seat when that music stops. And that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's an interesting thing, but it's not a bad thing because it, it shows just how much depth and talent there is at Vlad Kondonovsky's uh, disposal. And unlike the World Cup, this is only 18 players and a couple of them uh, are going to be goalkeepers uh, for sure. So it, it you know, the, the, the spaces become very short um, and limited very, very quickly. Uh, first game was, as I said, not impressive uh, in terms of the win over Canada. And by the way, as you mentioned, a a mediocre Canada, uh, so not even not even a full straight Canada, and yet the amount of times that they were able to create opportunities, even at times from breaking the press, and they don't necessarily have world beaters up top, and yet they found ways to do that. They certainly matched the U.S. when it came to intensity and the physical aspect uh, of it, um, and I think it was a reminder. It wasn't an emergency. It's not, it's not, oh my goodness, the sky is falling type of situation, but it was a reminder to that team that is so good that nobody cares what you did before. All right. Nobody cares that you are the world champions um, last two world world cups. When it comes to uh, world cups, nobody cares how famous you are, how much money you are, uh, how much attention you have uh, when that whistle blows. And as a matter of fact, it's going to, I think embolden many others to fight even harder against you. And so you're going to have to pick it up. And I think that there was times, and a lot of this is rust and they're just getting back into it, but there were times, and I said it on, uh, on air last night where it was certainly sloppy and there was you know, almost an entitled way uh, that they were going about their business in that they, ex they expected a level of respect on the field that they weren't afforded. And it almost seemed to, uh, it, it almost seemed to confuse them as to why they weren't having success. And I think it was a reminder to people like Megan Rapino and Carly Lloyd and Becky Sobrin. Uh, so the old guard, but also to the new guard, uh, people like uh, Katarina Macario, uh, uh, how, how you have to bring it each and every time. And just because you are the U.S. doesn't mean anybody is going to uh, just let you walk and waltz all, all over them. Second game uh, was better. Um, I mean, and you're, some of the substitutions that we have to show about the depth. I mean, when an Andonovsky is, is is subbing in uh, in one point, uh, you know, Mor Morgan Press and uh, Morgan Press, uh, sorry, <laughs> Kristen Press and Alex Morgan uh, are, are coming off the bench in the first game. And the second game, Carly Lloyd and Megan Rapinoe are coming off the bench. So a lot of firepower at their disposal. And both games, substitutes came in and, and fundamentally changed the game and sealed the game for uh, for the U.S. So we judge coaches oftentimes on the substitutions. I think that was uh, that was good. Um, Alex Morgan uh, got the start in the second game. And I didn't realize uh, until you told me, Mossy, that was her first start since the final of the 2019 World Cup. And look, the last year has featured pregnancy, um, COVID, and injury. And so she's trying to reestablish herself. I thought she looked good uh, in the game that she started that, sec uh, that, that second game. All in all, like I said, not necessarily cause for alarm, but a, a needed type of reminder. And it's interesting because this team often gets that reminder before a, a tournament in the spring. They, they suffer a defeat. They didn't in this case, but there was the reminder that you got to pick it up. And they are at times a slow burn and they, they peak often at the perfect moment, which is in the, which is in the summer, this summer, it'll be in the, uh, in the Olympics. And you, you hope that that is happening, but all in all much better competition and quality of competition. And, you know, they were exposed, they were exposed to speed in the back when the press doesn't work. Um, they were exposed to 
uh, errors and unforced errors that other teams and better teams will make them pay for. And they were lucky not to give up a bunch of goals. All right. Yeah. You, yeah. They missed opportunities in that first game against Canada, but Canada could have had three goals. They could have had a penalty kick. And then Brazil, the amount of chances that they, uh, that they missed and created with some of their speed and some of their direct play right down to gut of what the U S was doing. Um, that has to be concerning. But as I said before, it's this is not a, a, a situation where uh, where there, where it's an emerging uh, emergency type of situation. Um, who 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 do you think are the big winners and losers coming out of this uh, couple of games? Well, a winner for sure is Crystal Dunn, who it's amazing to think yeah. that uh, going into the 2019 World Cup, she was seen as a big question mark at left back. And, and what a player she is. Uh, I mean, unbelievable. Uh, and. and a loser. I mean, I, I reluctant to use the word loser for, you know, I thought Lynn Williams uh, struggled a little bit to finish off plays uh, yesterday. I know Vodko really talks up her work rate and how much she helps in pressing and, and tracking back. So she does bring those qualities to the table, but still as a forward up there, you'd like to see her put away some of those opportunities. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't as get, I mentioned, I don't Katarina Macario uh, struggled in that number 10 role in the first game and, and, and was dropped and Rose Lavelle started in that spot in the second game. So Maybe those two. Yeah, I don't get the Lynn Williams experiment. Uh, I, I just don't. I don't see it yet. In that, I don't see what Vlaco sees. But you know, it's that's 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 his opinion. When it comes to Crystal Dunn, uh, you are absolutely spot on, my friend. There is possibly on this team nobody of more value um, in terms of of what she does. She, I know she doesn't want to play left back, but. Guess what? When she is playing left back, she is arguably arguably the best left back in the world. I know she wants to play higher up the uh, up the field, and she's made it very very public and clear that she wants to be higher up the field. But don't kill the messenger. The fact is that she is world class, and as I said, arguably the best left back in the world at left back. And the further up the field she gets, I'm not saying that she can't uh, do some damage and she can't figure it out, but there are others that are better than her. And just because she does it in NWSL doesn't mean that that's the position for her uh, on uh, the U.S. Women's National Team. But I want her at that left back position because she puts out fires uh, and it's not just about her defensive ability. It's uh, sometimes her best defense is actually going forward and what she provides going forward and the threat that she is uh, going forward. And in, a, and in a way, she can redefine that position with the freedom that she has and obviously playing on the U.S. where you get that opportunity and that freedom to go forward. And then her actual defensive responsibilities, so smart in the positions that she uh, she picks up. Uh, and as I said, at times when those center backs are being exposed for pace, she is often there as that relief valve and that person that cleans up and she may have to clean up some more messes if that space develops and it gets into a, a foot race. And, you know, we saw her time and time again, come back and be that last, that last man, uh, even clearing some stuff and making shot saving uh, tackles and stuff like that. So absolutely, I, I, I second that 100%. She is critical and she is undeniably a starter uh, and I want her at left back, even though she wants to play uh, higher up the field. Uh, one more game, as we said, for the US playing uh, Argentina. You don't see anything but a win out of this, right, Masi? Yeah, definitely a win. And this could be the game where they break out in this tournament and have like a five or six nil. Yeah. Uh, and you know that 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 is expected, uh, given what the U.S. is and given what Argentina isn't. But these two games are, the, are going to be ones that they will go over and watch plenty of video uh, of. Um, okay, uh, and as I said, they're getting ready to uh, to uh, you know to hopefully do well in that Olympics. Uh, men's team uh, starts up qualifying here in a few weeks for potentially going also to that uh, Olympics. And we will have that actually on Fox. And I'm looking forward to uh, diving into that and hopefully a return after missing a couple of cycles uh, from the men's perspective of the Olympics, because it is important and uh, we've wasted that opportunity. All right, Mossy, yeah, should we move on to some other stuff here? Yep. All right, let's talk about this, uh, this kid. What were you doing when you were 15 years old, Mossy? Where were you when you were 15? Uh, I was keeping track of soccer stats and not dating and actually very similar to what I'm doing right now. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I was in, uh, well, I would have been a sophomore, I guess, in high school in, uh, in Michigan. 
And I was playing soccer and I, I had shown an ability, but nothing like uh, this, and we'll use the word prodigy here, of Alex Alcala, I think is how we, we are pronouncing it here. He is the uh, newest signing to um, the LA Galaxy 2 uh, team, which is, for those that don't know, the, uh, the lower division team and therefore stocked with talent or potential talent and young and inexperienced type of talent uh, for what they hopefully feel is going to be a rapid ascent to the full team and maybe bigger and better things going forward. This is a player who has enjoyed stints with, uh, let's see, Man City, Barcelona, and Pachuca in terms of training. Uh, and even at the age of 12, he was recognized. He's played uh, for Mexico at the under-15 level, uh, I think. And so this is a player that a lot of teams around the world uh, are going to spend some time and going to spend some money on because we're extrapolating it out and thinking that he's going to improve and be a great player. If you go online, you'll actually find all sorts of videos of this kid, uh, both in terms of action on the field, but also training videos and things that he is, uh, he is doing. Is he the real deal? I don't know. Is this another Freddie Adu? We've talked so much about Freddie Adu over the last few weeks. Um, I, I don't know if ultimately he is going to pan out, uh, but it's, it's worth talking about it and it's worth uh, you know, looking at this story and maybe some of the pitfalls that Freddie Adu went through or was pushed into, uh, we've debated that before, uh, he's going to avoid with this type of uh, progress right here. Do you know anything about this uh, player or did you know anything about this player until this news came out that uh, uh, LA Galaxy 2 uh, are signing this player? Uh, not really. Uh, and we should mention Manchester City have a purchase option on him as soon as he turns 18 and is eligible to go to Europe. So who knows if he'll even play for the Galaxy first team. Uh, this might be a, sort of a Gio Reyna situation who yep. came up through the NYCFC Academy, but then uh, went to Dortmund before ever playing for the NYCFC first team. Um, and he is eligible for the United States. He was born in California to Mexican parents. So if he develops, that's going to turn into another one of those recruiting dual national battles. Uh, but yeah, I, I was going to go the Freddie route too, uh, because we've talked so much about him, that Grant Wall documentary, and and a lot of people spoke in that documentary about how MLS is in a much better place today than it was back then. And so if a similar situation occurred today, they would handle it much better. And the league is now very adept at developing young players. And so this is something of a test case of that. And let's see how, uh, well, well, hold on. I mean, already it's not mirroring what Freddie was <laughs> exposed to or the, or the position that Freddie was put in as the face of the league. I mean, Freddie, you know, it's, it's, it, we're not mothballing this, this kid, cause you'll still be able to see him, but it's not as if he's playing uh, next to Chicharito uh, come in a few weeks when, uh, when the league kicks off. So, so it, it is a little bit different. The, the hype is there and the knowledge and excitement of what he is, especially in our technology age where you step on the field and you show any type of <laughs> prowess or ability, it's going to be documented and immediately up on, uh, on YouTube. And you can, uh, you can find all of that, like I, like I said, but the route that he is taking here, apart from the actual age, um, which, which does you know, kind of mirror what we saw with Freddie, it's a very, very different route and path uh, going forward, which may or may not be good for, for him. And he may be on the accelerated uh, you know, route and, and going forward. But to your point, if he does come good, does he ever play in MLS uh, because of that sell on or that option that uh, Man City evidently has? Um, or does he ever play for the United States uh, when it comes to the national team, if he's that good? And we, you know, we start thinking about these things and maybe we're putting the cart before the horse. But you know, this is what we do with prodigies. This is this is the whole point of getting excited and hyping up these young players. And some of them live up to our, our expectations. Some of them fall short. Some of them fall dramatically short. Uh I hope, you know, I'm, I'm, I hope that this is not uh, another Freddie you do, but what I, what, what makes me at least, um, I guess, happy, if you will, is that right now he's not being put in that type of position that Freddie, uh, that Freddie was put in from the, uh, from the start. I don't know anything else about, uh, what's his name again? Alex Alcala. Are you prepared to say that in order to justify the hype, he has to lead the U S or Mexico to a 
World no, it's Cup a completely title? different time and place, <laughs> Mossy. I know what I know what you're doing there. I know what you're doing. Yes, it's it is it is such a and that's that's a good thing. That means that we've progressed. That means that we have evolved. We don't we don't need this 15 year old prodigy to sell Major League Soccer or to sell the Los Angeles Galaxy. Back when Freddie came about, yeah, we needed it and we and we used it. And thank you, Freddie, because he helped um, whatever. And we've talked about this a million, a million times, but he helped. Alex, go do your thing. Uh, and I hope that you live up to the expectations and to your already you know, very robust re uh, resume that you have, even as a 15 year old. I didn't know what the hell I was doing when I was 15 years old. Uh, Mossy, uh, one more thing before we go here, right? Uh, let's uh, let's go over. Let's go to the Great White North. How about that? Vancouver, all sorts of stuff going on. For those that don't know, the Vancouver Whitecaps, uh, how should I say this? Um, they've not been very good. OK, they haven't made the playoffs in the last three years. This is one of the storied historic clubs in uh, in soccer in Canada, a club that you know, even back when I was growing up, we we knew about because uh, of its, like I said, its long history. And yet, other than Alfonso Davies, eh, it's not a, been a whole lot to talk about uh, and certainly to celebrate when it comes to uh, Vancouver Whitecaps. Well, they, they, have, uh, they have gone out and they have tried to fix that. And they've decided that in order to fix that, they need better people behind the scenes and better people making decisions. So they have gone out in, in, in line with, maybe this isn't a fair uh, you know, title to put on it, but in, in Moneyball fashion, shall we say, they've gone out and hired Nikos Overhaul. I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that. It's, it's O-V-E-R-H-E-U-L. So we're going to call him Nikos. Nikos is great. I mean, I like that, but I think it's over whole or there's probably, you know, some sort of accent uh, or pronunciation that I'm that I'm not quite there. But anyway, Nikos Overhaul uh, and they've hired him as the director of recruitment. Now, that's in and of itself isn't necessarily a big thing, but, you know, he comes from the analytics world and he comes from the success and a lot of the focus on Brentford and Michelin. Uh, the two clubs that very, very publicly said, we are going to use the data and the, uh, the analytics out there to create this team. And in both cases have become very, very successful, both in terms of the results on the field relative to others, and certainly uh, the value and the money that has been generated in terms of, of sales. So it's not new necessarily that somebody comes in and wants to use analytics to try to crack the code that is Major League Soccer. But, you know, they believe that this is going to happen. Uh, our good friend Charlie Bohm over there uh, at MLSsoccer.com wrote a long article which, with a whole lot more details. And the reason why we're bringing this up, Masi, you're a, you're a numbers guy, right? I mean, I know you, you love the beauty and the romance of the game, but you're also a numbers guy. And as as the world has changed and as people, like I said, have tried to crack this code and this unique code of soccer and to use numbers and use data and use analytics to figure it out, there's more and more of this happening. When you actually read the article, it's almost as if Nikos goes out of his way to push aside the analytics part in that he knows that that sometimes turns people off and basically just frame himself as a scout, a glorified scout uh, and recruiter, if you will, of talent in that he watches games and augments it with this data background that he has. Mossy, I guess, first off, in general, um, do you think that soccer, and we've talked about it before, which doesn't always lend itself, you have a game where you could not have the ball for 89 minutes and still win the game. You have a game where you could take one shot relative to the other team taking 50 shots and still, uh, and still win the game. Does it, does it, do you still think that it lends itself to numbers and analytics and, and data? And so do you think, therefore, this is a, a good hire? I know neither of us know him, know him personally, other than what uh, we've seen in, uh, him do at other places. Well, yeah, the point that he makes in the piece is that he knows how to interpret the information and then combine it with information he's getting from more traditional scouting methods and drawing the right conclusions and making the right decisions. And so, yeah, if you use it in that fashion, if you're not uh, a slave to the numbers, but it's just another piece of information that you combine with other things, I think absolutely. Why wouldn't you want to have that's, the most information possible? Isn't that obvious though? I mean, who, who's not going to tell you that? Who's not, who's going to say, yep, uh, it's just, it's just a formula. I just put well, in the numbers you know, did, uh, and it tells me who starts. I just put in the numbers. It tells me who to, who to, uh, uh, who to go buy uh, or who to trade for. Nobody does that. Everybody 
everybody recognizes that it's just a, a piece of the puzzle. So he's not really telling us anything new or different. Uh, it's funny, reading this story did make me reflect back on the whole Moneyball uh, controversy, which for people that don't uh, remember, in the late 90s, uh, baseball, which doesn't have a salary cap, had a real issue with economic disparity. The big market teams were spending a lot more than the small market teams. One team in particular, the Yankees, was spending way more than anybody else, and they won four World Series in five years. So there was a lot of hand-wringing about that, the same kind of stuff we hear now with some of these European leagues and the way Bayern Munich dominates the Bundesliga and PSG, Liga, etc., um, and so uh, in the midst of all that, Michael Lewis, this author, decided to uh, write a book about the Oakland A's, who were one of the more successful small market teams. And he spent a season with them and he wanted to understand how a small market team functions in this environment. And, and he spent a great deal of time with their general manager, Billy Bean, and, and, and wrote this famous book called Moneyball, which was then turned into a movie in which Brad Pitt played Billy Bean. And before the book came out, the excerpts that were released were about Billy Bean bragging about fleecing another general manager in a trade. And so the sports media being what it is, uh, the whole discussion about the book became uh, this referendum on Billy Bean and whether he's actually a genius or not. But really the most interesting part of the book was it revealed what an increasing role Saber Metrics is playing in the decision making of baseball teams, and, it, and it's it's true. It's now become it's it's in baseball is a sport where it's attained total acceptance, and I think today you'd be like laughed out of a baseball front office if you said you didn't believe in analytics or Saber Metrics. Um, in soccer, I agree with you. It's it's been a bit more of a slow burn. I think it is achieving a certain level of acceptance, and and particularly here in MLS, but even in Europe, some clubs are using it to a higher degree. But it, it's not all the way there. There still is this sort of mm -hmm. battle pitting old school traditional folk who who prefer those, those scouting methods and still feel like you have to go and watch a game versus others who put a lot more stock in this stuff. And so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, like I said, I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle, but it is a fascinating debate for sure. You know, I, I, I love the, the data uh, and I would have loved to have much more data uh, when I was playing. I remember, and I think I've told you this before, well, I, I used to get rookies to chart my past completions. Um, nowadays, it would happen on your wrist or it would happen on your chest and it would be instantaneous and somebody would be not only charting your completions, but every touch of the ball. And then it would be immediately there on your phone uh, at halftime and, and all that. Uh, because I, I knew that as a center back, most of my passes were going to be secure and safe. And if I was losing more than one or two balls in terms of a risky ball or a hopeful type of ball, um, I knew something was going wrong in the back um, uh, for what for what I was doing, but but you're right. There is, and it's not you know some of it's generational. I, I get that, but I don't. I think MLS maybe more so than other leagues um, is is much more open to it. And maybe it comes from you know the the analytics part of our, of, of our other sports and what's going on, uh, you know passing the eye test and all that kind of stuff and all that old school, I can see it, you know, I can see the talent out there. That's never going to go away. It, in the same way that we talk about VAR giving these men and women who are making decisions, they're still subjective decisions, but they have more uh, information at their disposal when they are making these decisions. It's the same thing with, with analytics, okay? It's still ultimately subjective. I'm not saying the numbers are subjective. The numbers say what they say, but using those numbers is just giving those men and women uh, more information. And so they are more informed when they make these decisions about, uh, about who to sign, about who to play. Um, you know, and, and I think that's a good thing, but ultimately it's going to come down to, to the winning. You got to be able to show that that analytics that you are using and that Nikos over here is providing talent and identifying talent and doing it in in a way that hasn't been done before or that they can't do uh without him and you know this is a team that has not been very good well we'll end on this but what i think was really interesting was to hear how nikos looked at the unique aspect and structure of mls in particular as ripe for this because the you know we we're talking about the disparity of baseball Yes, there has been a separation uh, of the haves and have nots, but still relative to most other soccer leagues and certainly the ones that Nikos has worked in, you know, the, 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 par the parity and the manufactured parity is in existence. And I think he sees an opportunity within that to, you know, to, you know, the, to work on those fine different types of margins out there to make this team, this team better. And right now, if you were to look at the Vancouver Whitecaps, the goal should be 
make the playoffs this year. That would be a step in the right direction. Does it come because of what Nikos is doing in terms of the talent that he identifies or assessing the talent that they already have in terms of who's playing? I don't know, but that's uh, that's really going to be interesting to see if this hire changes their fortunes and how it's done. He gave us a nice little peek behind the scenes. I recommend, uh, I recommend you read it. But I also, I think he sees in a strange way that MLS has a, because of its structure and because of where it is, has a much better ability to... Uh, to utilize this type of technology because of the structure that we have. Anything else, Mossy? That's it. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, oh, yeah, we'll take a spin around Europe. Don't go anywhere. All right, we're back. And we're going to take a spin around Europe here and the rest of the world. Uh, but we're starting with Mo. We are starting with Jose Mourinho. All right, Mossy. I mean, look, he's the gift that keeps on giving, right? Um, love him, hate him. You cannot not talk about him. OK, uh, wheels are falling off <laughs> at, at Spurs right now. Uh, and when that happens, he is the master of deflection. Um, but he is also the master of commanding all the uh, time and space and air in that room and saying stuff that is controversial uh, and saying stuff that from a content perspective is great because he just generates it on a continual basis. And he. Uh, he did it again this week, even after the team lost again. They are in free fall right now. Top four is certainly in question, which would be devastating to uh, to Spurs. His job certainly has to be in question right now. And yet he doubles down and, and in one fell swoop talks about how great he and his staff are and uh, the, the best basically in the world. And yet what he has at his disposal, he can't do the things that ultimately he wants to do. I think I've, I've paraphrased his comments there, Mossy. What, I, I know you have so much to say about Mourinho, so I'll let you take it from here. No, I mean, I, I went on a rant about him last week, which our producer Jeff Fernandez loved, so he wants to team me up again here. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's just no self-reflection. There, there, it's never even a little bit his fault. Uh, you know, he points out that his coaching methods are the best in the world, but... Uh, they're losing because of things that are completely out, outside of his control, like VAR decisions. And then, and then this vague sort of, there are problems at the club that are outside of my control that are weighing us down. Nobody knows what he's talking about there. Uh, and yeah, the bottom line is they, they lose to West Ham this weekend. David Moyes, by the way, doing a phenomenal job. West Ham are in the top four. Um, and Spurs are all the way down in ninth. They've lost five of their last six league games. Um, and where this is headed, and I said this all along, um, is uh, Pochettino finished second in the Premier League and got to a Champions League final. And Mourinho is not going to touch him in those two competitions. And in other words, the two main competitions that an English club can play in, he's not going to perform as well as Pochettino. But he does have a knack for winning trophies. So I could see him winning a League Cup, a Europa League. And, and then Mourinho and his devotees will point out, well, Pochettino didn't win anything. I've won trophies. So by definition, I'm... I've done a better job. And so we're, we're going to be left arguing the merits of these lesser competitions. Uh, I mean, look, they're already in the league cup final uh, this season. They play city in the final, which will be a tall order, but it's one game, 90 minutes. They could win that. Uh, that'll be in sometime in April. And they're still in the Europa League knockout stage, looking like one of the stronger teams there. So it wouldn't surprise me actually if they won a trophy this season, but uh, finish, you know, mid table in the premier league. And so it, we're going to have to sort of make sense out of that. Does that constitute a success or failure? It's going to be an interesting debate. Wow. I mean, well, trophies are important. We, we, you know, that's that money shot. And those, those do resonate. They resonate uh, now and they resonate uh, as you move on because people, uh, people point to them. Uh, but I mean, it begs the question then, Mossy, Fisher cut bait with him. I mean, what, what it, does it, does it depend on those trophies? Does it depend on them finding a way? I mean, I don't, I don't know how they're going to find a way to uh, the top four or where they're standing now, unless they go on a, a very, very good run and they have not looked like they've been going on a run. So would you, would you keep them or would you uh, get rid of them? Yeah, it would be very expensive to get rid of him. I, I, I read a piece in The Athletic a few days ago. The details of his contract are such that it'd be pretty expensive to get rid of him, which in these pandemic times, you, you club like Tottenham, everybody is being a little gun shy with managers right now because mm -hmm. of the, the, the financial problems during this pandemic. So I think you probably give him a full season and, and, and see where you're at uh, and, then, and then make a decision. I wouldn't get rid of him now. I wouldn't either. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd keep him. I don't know if... 
I don't know if it's going to change to his liking in terms of the talent, but I would like to see what this team looks like going through, uh, you know, a summer transfer and see what it looks like on that other side. And if, if he is given, you know, additions or subtractions for that matter uh, going forward. And, you know, look, if they don't make top four, do some of these players say, well, I'm not going to stick a stick around here. I'm going to, you know, we've talked about Harry Kane looking at different places over the years. Does that, uh, does, does that end up happening? Yeah. I think you keep them though. I think not, not, and not even because of the money, honestly, I, even if the money wasn't, wasn't an issue, I still think you, you give them a little bit uh, longer, but I love him. I, you know, I'm, I'm a stand from, is that what the kids say? I'm a stand for him. That's right. <laughs> That's uh, that has its roots. Hold in on. Let M&M me go get my song, white claw. Which, uh, um, all right. M&M had a, had a, crazy fan named Stan. And so now that, that's oh, okay. become part of the Got lexicon. Well, thanks for, uh, yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for explaining that to me. Like I said, uh, white calls, white claws for all. Um, all right. What else, Moss? You want to, uh, any, anything else pique your interest over there? Liverpool. I mean, talk about a sinking ship. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and people I've asked, I've been asked over this last week by a ton of people, what's wrong with Liverpool? What's the, you know, what's the problem? I, and I don't think it's, it's not one thing. It's just, and I think they're going to be given a pass and I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't be, maybe, maybe I'm being too easy on one of the great clubs, but what they did over the last couple of years, there is, you know, there is a currency that is built up. Um, but maybe, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's not fair. I don't know. You think that's fair to give them a pass? Yeah, I mean, the, the tangible, in terms of what's wrong, the tangible is the injuries at the back. And Jordan Henderson goes down against Everton. So uh, I think they're now up to their 18th different center back combination of the season. Uh, and we've talked about the, the domino effect with the rest of the team and having to take some of your best midfielders and play them at the back. Uh, the intangible is uh, that team just looks mentally worn down. They've played so many games the last couple of seasons and, and, uh, it's just not happening for them. Yeah, they lose 2-0 at home to Everton, their first home loss to Everton since 1999. They've lost four uh, straight home league games. First time that's happened since 1923. They're now down to sixth place. So they have a, a fight on their hands to finish in the top four as well. So, um, yeah, incredible what's happened with them. Uh, and it's still over, right? I mean, uh, you're, there's no ray or, or, or glimmer of hope or light out there when it comes to the title, right? No, uh, City won again. They beat Arsenal. Well, no, actually weren't at their best. They scored two minutes in with Sterling, and you thought, oh, my God, the floodgates are going to open here. This is going to be a rout. But no, it ended that way, 1-0. Uh, but nevertheless, another three points for uh, Pep. And uh, yeah, there's still 10 points clear. It feels like 20 points, frankly, because they're so much better than everybody else. So uh, no, they're – and in fact, I'll – uh, I'm going to tag this whole weekend review by making a point about uh, title races in general across Europe. Well, you know who doesn't complain about injuries, Mossy? That would be Lester. Okay, they just they just keep rolling on. So you can complain about injuries if you want. And, and look, I'm not saying that uh, that Liverpool. I mean, that's that's a lot. That's a lot of injuries. But and and like and like I said, they're going to be given the benefit of the doubt. And maybe in my older age, I'm just becoming kinder and gentler, Mossy. I don't know. I when I was a young buck, I, I probably wouldn't have allowed allowed for any type of leeway when it comes to Liverpool, but who knows, you know, we, we live and learn and maybe we just grow more kind. <laughs> uh, what else uh, from over there in uh, jolly old England? Uh, no, that's it. I can move on to Italy. Are you really? Uh, okay. You, uh, do you want, Oh, do you want to hit it just to, uh, before we go on? You want to hit up? Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Chelsea and Christian Pulisic. He, he continues to, well, why don't we're going to talk Chelsea in the Ask Alexi segment. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll uh, save yeah, it Yeah, actually, that. one thing we should hit, uh, I forgot, is terrible news, Jordan Morris, yeah. um, who uh, suffered a serious injury uh, in Swansea's game against Huddersfield in the championship, and it's now been revealed that it, it is an ACL injury. He's going to miss the rest of the season. Man. So, terrible break, just five games into this stint with a new club, him finally going to Europe, and this happens. Yeah, so he misses Europe, he misses MLS, he misses Gold Cup, he misses uh, obviously the qualifying process for this team, which starts up in the fall. Um, yeah, this is, oh, this is. I, I feel so bad f- uh, for him, and um, yeah, but I mean, he's he's come back before, so he's a strong young man, and you know, we wish him the best on his uh, recovery. It was horrible to see him get stretchered off, and to have that that moment that we know meant so much for him. And from a practical perspective, if you're if you're Seattle, this is what you what you feared uh, would happen. You 
you gave him this opportunity for, because of all that he has done for your club with the understanding that, you know, you're, you're risking. And now that risk has, uh, has shown itself and come to fruition. Ah, killer, killer, horrible. Uh, what else, Mossy? Should we move on to another uh, country? Yep. Where should we go now? Italia. Uh, let's go to Italia where uh, a match that was billed as the biggest Milan derby in a decade, uh, first against second, and uh, Inter thump uh, AC Milan 3-0. Inter have done more to bring back the strike partnership than any other club. Uh, back when you played in the 90s, uh, it was the normal for teams to have two up top. I'm sure playing in Serie A week in, week out, you know, you always thought of it in terms of a partnership you're facing, you know. Um, and then somewhere along the line, it became very in vogue to play in a 4-3-3 or a 4-2-3-1 and just have one guy up there. And, and now we're seeing the strike partnership come back a little bit. There are other examples of it throughout Europe, but Inter is the one that really jumps out at me with this Lukaku-Lautaro combination they have. Those two guys, they play so well together. And when they're both in form, Inter is a very tough team to be. We saw that again this past weekend. It was two goals by Lautaro. The first one set up beautifully by Lukaku, and then Lukaku got the third. So a comprehensive victory for Inter. They are now four points clear at the top of the table. It's really trending towards them winning Serie A, which would be a nice feather in Antonio Conti's cap. I know he's a pain in the neck, but the man can coach. So Inter now in command of that race. I was listening to uh, my good friend, uh, Tony Miola and uh, Brian Dun Dun Dunseth on their uh, show the other day, and they were talking about how this was a referendum in that this, the winner of this traditional and classic derby, um, whoever won it was going to win Serie A and win the Scudetto. Do you, do you agree or do you, are you, are you okay to call it now? Or uh, I know we're into calling things early now. Calling it, but uh, I, I, if I had to pick right now, I, I definitely would pick Inter to win Serie A. They've emerged as the clear, clear favorites. I love the fact that there are two up top. And, you know, it's cyclical, right? Everything comes and goes. And, and you know, the next greatest thing was actually the, the greatest thing from the past. And so playing two up top, as you rightly mentioned, used to be normal. Almost every team that I came up against during my career, uh, for the most part, there was two players, uh, two players up top. And then... You know, the game changed, but Lukaku, what he has done since coming to Italy, well, we always knew he was a good and at times great player, but man, oh man. I mean, when you look at players up top right now in terms of where they are at this moment, you know, you're talking and we'll talk more about, you know, people like Holland and Lewandowski, uh, and Lukaku's got to be in that conversation now of some of the greats up top, regardless if they two, play two or one, just, you know, for, for goal scoring and people up there. And it's fun to see. And in doing so, you know, they, they've brought Inter back to, you know, the, uh, the top, if you will. I mean, you know, back, in, back when I was there many, many years ago, it was Juventus, Inter, and Milan. It still is, but it's, it's changed a lot since then, and certainly when you can when it comes to Inter, it's nice to see. I'm uh, I'm happy to see, and that it's happening uh, here for someone like uh, Lukaku, who's just and that and that whole Lukaku Ibra <laughs> battle is just awesome. When you faced Inter '94 '95, was that Dennis Burkamp? Was Dennis he... Burkamp. Yep, they had uh, Burkamp. Uh, he was. I'll never forget being in the uh, anti-doping room after because we both got pulled, and since. Very few people spoke English that I was facing. It was nice because we actually could sit there while we were downing liquids to try to <laughs> move things along, as the case may be or was. Um, I remember talking to him, and he was done. I mean, he was – this is before, obviously, he went to England where he starred and became a legend. You know, he was still a great player, but the – the world of Italian soccer and the pressure, you could just, you, you could feel it in the way that he talked uh, and the way in his body language, everything, it had gotten to him and he needed a change of scenery. Uh, and, and boy, did he get one and never looked back, but it was amazing talking to him. Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, back then, yeah, Inter was, Inter was something and they are again. Uh, anything else, uh, uh, Serie A wise? Uh, no, let's jump to Spain. All right. Uh, big, big happenings there. Um, a title race that you tried very hard to get me to call 
Uh, and thank God I didn't because my, my <laughs> pristine reputation would have been in tatters. Um, yeah, Atletico Madrid. We, we we have a race in Spain again. And you know who we have to thank for that, uh, Alexi? Who's that? Who's Little that? Levante, who um, – this was slightly bizarre, to be honest. Atletico's first league game against Levante this season was postponed, and they scheduled it for – right after the other game between those two teams. So I've never seen this before. Atletico and Levante played back-to-back league games against each other, which was strange. And Atletico ended up drawing one and losing the other. So they dropped five points in these two games against Levante, which that coincided with Real Madrid having won four straight somehow because they're not playing that well, but they're just grinding out victories right now. The latest one, 1-0 over Valladolid, Casemiro with the winner. And so uh, Real Madrid have crept to within three points of Atletico Madrid. Atletico have played one fewer game, but still, even if they win that six is much more manageable than it was a few weeks ago. Barcelona in third place, eight points back. So, yeah, I think it's fair to say I Liga. We do have a race in Spain again. Would I mean, if I had to take all of Mr. Mossy's money and go to uh, Vegas, what would you put it on? Boy, I, I mean, it's hard not it's hard to bet against Real Madrid with, you know, coming down the, the stretch here. Right. Yeah, I think I'd still Gun in my head still say Atletico, but uh, really, yeah, suddenly it's, th- don't is, it's three either. points now. Yeah, three points. At Atletico have played one fewer game. Okay, so they got a game in hand. Do, do they? Do, does Real Madrid and Atletico play again? Do we know? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. I, perhaps uh, Jeff Hernandez can look. All up right. The- well, I mean, so there's there's a lot to look forward to. It is. It's not wide open, but at least we have a race at the top. And and hey, it's not necessarily the race that we you know, you know actually I want to say it's coming up next because there was some talk going into this Levante game about or it's coming up very soon because there was some talk about was Luis Suarez gonna pick up an intentional yellow to in pick up a suspension but in, in the game prior to it and make sure he's available for the derby. So yeah, March seventh, uh those two teams meet. So it's right around the corner. Um but yeah, so so things in Spain heating up. And, and j- just put a button on this little weekend review of ours. Uh, also, uh, great title races suddenly in Germany and France. Uh, in Germany, Bayern Munich stumbling a bit. They lose to Eintracht Frankfurt while Leipzig defeated Hertha Berlin. So the gap is now down to two points. Bayern just two points ahead of Leipzig. And then over in France... Lil, uh, Timothy Way and company continue to roll. They're in first place. They're one point up on Lyon and PSG in third place, four points back with 12 rounds to go. So this is starting to get serious for them. They lost at home this weekend to Monaco 2-0. Nico Kovac doing a terrific job at Monaco. But so amazingly, amazingly enough, as you take a step back here of the top five leagues in Europe, the only one that doesn't really have a compelling title race is England, right. where the gap between first and second is 10. If you go everywhere else, the gap between first and second is in Germany is two points, in France one point, in Italy four points, and in Spain three points. So, uh, And all of these have this tortoise and the hare type of situation going on <laughs> where this team went out in front and everything and it's cruising along, and now some of the big... The big guns are coming, coming along. So look out. Oh, that's good. I mean, this is this is this is what we want. This is what we want from all of these uh, different leagues. Uh, before we end, uh, let, should we take a little uh, Champions League roundup here? Absolutely. All right. It was a fun week, right? I mean, it was it was one of the one of the better weeks uh, when it comes to the action and the goals and the performances, right? What what and, stood what stood well, out the, for you? Remind the, the folks. Biggest story in European yeah. football right now, and I'm curious to get your take on this. Was uh, the performances of Mbappe and Holland last week? Um, right. uh, I, I I tweeted this that one of the staples of the Messi Ronaldo rivalry was that if one did something great on a UCL Tuesday, the other one would always respond on a Wednesday. And I got some of those same vibes last week. Mbappe on a Tuesday scores a hat trick for PSG away to Barcelona. And then on Wednesday, Holland, two goals and one assist for Dortmund in their 3-2 away win over Sevilla. And Holland said after the match that Mbappe's performance the day before did serve as extra motivation for him. And so the big talk is, has the baton been passed from Messi and Ronaldo to these two? And is this the rivalry that's going to define the next decade of European football and if so um, who, which one would you rather have uh, where are they going to go and are those transfers going to be the ones that are going to sort of alter the balance of power so that's all been in the air the last few days what did you make of yeah it? I don't I don't think the that the that it, the, the but that it's been transferred I, I because neither of them are playing for you know one of the the biggest clubs in the world I think you, you kind of have to do that but who knows maybe that changes very very soon what was interesting to me is this this concept, and and maybe I just just assumed because I've I've been watching these players 
that this was kind of a coming out party. I mean, it's not as if they just dropped on the scene. I mean, <laughs> these guys have been, they scored in the World Cup final. I know, exactly. <laughs> and so, but, and, and yet the, even the questions to Mbappe after the game and everything about how seminal a moment this was. And I think even he was a little confused as to it. <laughs> almost, I almost expected him and you could, you could translate it into French for him to go, guys, I've been doing this all along. I mean, this should not be the surprise or this awakening of the world that I don't, I, I, to, to describe it like that, or that narrative out there, that to me was, was a little bit strange. You know, the fact that these guys are great and they may become the, you know, serve, you know, volley back and forth type of situation that we saw with Messi and Ronaldo, that would, that would be great. Is it going to happen for PSG and Dortmund? Uh, I'm not quite sure. So we're, I think we're still a couple of years, I guess, away until they are at that moment, unless these two teams become the new Barcelona, Real Madrid, Man City, you know, type of situation. Uh, let me just say, I've I've accepted that Mbappe and Holland have clearly emerged as the top two when you're talking about young players that could really dominate the next few years. But I still love Jaden Sancho. And after a slow start to this season, when he was clearly affected by that failed transfer to Manchester United, he is back to his best. Uh, he was absolutely phenomenal in that game against Sevilla. I was texting with Keith Cossigan and Warren Barton during that game. We were all marveling at his talent, the change in direction, the way he just glides past defenders. Um, and he was great at the weekend against Schalke too, by the way. Uh, Holland followed up his Champions League performance with another great one, scoring two goals against Schalke on a 4-0 win, including this incredible oh God, acrobatic finish. While Mbappe, for what it's worth, he did not. He had a lousy game for PSG in that home loss to Monaco that I mentioned. But yeah, um, as far as Mbappe versus Holland, and yeah, Sancho, I would put a notch below those two, but still very high up there when you're talking about great young players. I love him. Uh, as far as Mbappe and Holland, I lean Mbappe. I just prefer that more of that all around attacking force. Although Holland shows me things that uh, every, every week, it seems he shows me something new that I didn't know he had in his locker, even in that Sevilla game, the way he, he nutmegged that defender on the first goal and, and then got the assist. And he's a lot more than just this big lumbering goal scorer. I mean, he's got a lot more to his game. Uh, the athleticism he showed in that goal I mentioned this past weekend against Shaka. So, yeah, I mean, it can't go wrong with either because Holland, too, is just absolutely incredible. You're going to have to remind me because this it, and it'll make sense here in a second or it might not. But in, in terms of Erling Holland, OK, who was uh, Lucio? Remember the, the big, tall center back, Brazilian center back played in Germany? Is that his name? Right. Of course. Yeah. So he would do things that were so abnormal to the way that he looked and our <laughs> traditional way of looking at center backs. And when it would happen, you would say, that's not supposed to happen that way. And, you know, Erling Holland, even in his character and personality, it's very, <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's very robotic at times and <laughs> Schwarzenegger esque type in terms of the answers that he gives. And, but behind it, there's this, you know, there's this light and there's this um, sense of humor and wit and uh, c cleverness in the way that he acts. And then on the field, it manifests in doing stuff that he shouldn't necessarily do. <clears throat> yes, there is a ruthless efficiency oftentimes in what he does. But there's, there's dare, dare I say it, a, a beauty and creativity and yes, a, a, a romantic, maybe not in the in the Brazilian sense, but yes, a, a romance in, in the way that he tries different things and the way that he does different things and the way that he smiles, the way that he celebrates that, that go beyond just what I thought that first impression of him was. And that's, 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 what's exciting. You know, you mentioned the goal that, that he scored that that's, a, that's a hard goal to score. Okay. <laughs> a side, you know, side volley with his left foot out of the air that he even thought to do that in that in that moment and that they had the the physical awareness especially for a big guy to be able to uh, to do that I mean and that's just another thing in his arsenal okay so it's uh it's amazing I I still think right now if you can have one or the other you're still going Mbappe but it's it's getting closer and closer every single Absolutely. almost every week right uh yeah and, and then the, just to wrap up the other two games last week uh liverpool yeah in the midst of these uh incredible domestic struggles actually had a nice result uh in europe uh they beat leipzig 2-0 this match played in budapest and then the other one was porto beat juventus 2-1 uh 
Um, Juventus, that, that, that late goal, though, very important for them. They were down 2 0, and they, they get in a way, boy, big difference between losing 2 0 and 2 1. Uh, that goal, by the way, uh, scored by Federico Chiesa, who uh, is the son of Enrico Chiesa, another player I'm pretty sure you, you faced in Serie A. And it's the first Champions League knockout stage goal scored by a Juventus player not named Cristiano Ronaldo since the 2018 quarterfinals when uh, current Inter Miami star Blaise Matuidi scored against Real Madrid at the Bernabeu. It was that crazy game where Juventus got whistled for a penalty late and Buffon went nuts and bumped Michael Oliver and got sent off. And Cristiano Ronaldo converted a penalty in stoppage time to send Real Madrid through and knock out Juventus. Then Juventus signed him that summer. And in his first two seasons, he had scored all seven of their knockout stage goals. Finally, in this game, somebody else stepped up, Federico Chiesa, and, and pulls a potentially very important goal back for Juventus because now going back home to one as screwed up as they are right now i still think they have a very good chance to go through oh yeah i mean i think your safe money is is still on juventus finding finding way and not not only because of that goal but that that changes the complexion uh, completely anything else uh champions league wise and then just quickly uh this week uh we have uh Atletico Madrid, Chelsea, that match being played in Bucharest. Uh, no Thiago Silva for Chelsea, which is bad news when you're facing Luis Suarez, but Christian Pulisic is in the squad. We'll talk more about Pulisic in the Ask Alexi segment. Um, Lazio facing Bayern Munich. Uh, when the draw came out, I said this was a 100% banker for Bayern. Despite their recent struggles, I still kind of feel that way. The big point of interest here is a great center forward matchup with Lewandowski against the Mobile. For all of Lewandowski's exploits last season, he did not win the Golden Boot and Mobile won it. So uh, you get two of the most prolific strikers in Europe. And then Wednesday, um, Gladbach, uh, quote unquote, host city. Uh, but this match uh, will be played in Budapest, same place where Leipzig faced Leverkusen. And yeah, I mean, never put it past Pep to screw up a Champions League game, but the way City are playing, you have to think that this tie should be no problem for them. And then the last one is Atalanta host Real Madrid. This one looks almost too obvious of an upset, which is giving me some pause because Real Madrid have not played well. Uh, they've got an incredible injury list. Uh, Benzema out for this game. Sergio Ramos out for this game. Hazard out for this game. Carvajal uh, and so they are limping in there against an Atalanta side, which is scoring goals for fun right now. Luis Muriel in great form, Zapata as well, Ilicic. Uh, they're getting goals from everywhere. And so everybody is on the Atalanta bandwagon in this matchup, and they think that they could do a number on them in this home leg and then go through. Uh, but like I said, it, it looks almost so obvious that it's giving me some pause. But I mean, it, it certainly on paper looks like Atalanta might actually have the edge here in this matchup. Ooh, Atalanta. Hey, but that, <laughs> that reminds me. Uh, I listened to a podcast uh, uh, over our friends over at ESPN. Sam Borden, I think, put it together uh, about Atalanta and that Champions League run and relative to the pandemic and uh, what happened. It's a fascinating look back a, a year ago, basically, about you know how... Uh, how First off, what it meant to that team and, and to that city, uh, but also how in the world uh, with the pandemic going on, that, um, that game and, uh, and that run may have contributed uh, going forward. So check that out. That, that just came to mind because I was listening to that. All right, Mossy, anything else? That's it. All right, we're going to take a real quick break. And when we come back, it's time for Ask Alexi. Don't go anywhere. All right, we're back. Uh, let's uh, get to some Ask Alexi questions here or comments out there. You use that hashtag Ask Alexi on all the different social media platforms, and uh, we pick a few each week. And uh, what do we got this week, Mussy? Uh, first up, uh, T-Bone. I wonder if that's a little sneaky Seinfeld reference there. But um, uh, Alexi Lalas, our women have won four World Cups and our men can't qualify. Why doesn't the women's game get the respect it deserves? Oh, interesting, T-Bone. Um, interesting in that that is your uh, that that's your perspective right now. I I, I tend to disagree with T-Bone. I think that the United States women na women's national team, relative certainly to the U.S. men's national team, gets almost all of the attention and the praise, and rightfully so. Uh, they have been, um, as I said, lauded and championed and praised uh, by our country for years now because of the success that they've had on the field and because of the incredible uh, people and personalities that they are uh, off the field. They have been given opportunities. They have uh, achieved levels of stardom and fame and wealth. Uh, uh, and, and as I said, been given uh, 
opportunities on and off the field in, in a great rate. Uh, and so I, I, I disagree with your premise here. And keep in mind that in 2017, when the U.S. went to Trinidad and Tobago and failed to qualify for the World Cup, they were roundly criticized and by everybody, by the way, not just your soccer mainstream, uh, your soccer media out there. I'm talking about everybody. Everybody got in and got their punches in on that U.S. team and that incredible epic uh, failure right now. So I, I think that, yes, one of the reasons why the women's team gets so much attention and, yes, gets so much respect is because of how good they are, is because of the four cups uh, that you uh, that you mentioned. And yes, the men didn't qualify right now. And, and I was talking to somebody on the phone earlier uh, today, um, a, uh, a woman who had been over, played soccer and had been over. And to see, you know, for, for her, it opened up her mind uh, to see the way that we as a nation respond and react and support our women's national team and directly and indirectly uh, women's soccer out there. Now, are there, are there moments and instances that you can point to? Yeah. And it's never going to be absolutely fair and equal all, all over the place. But right now there has never been a U.S. soccer team that has been more uh, promoted uh, and ultimately gotten more attention and praise, and rightfully and fairly so, than the U.S. women's national team. So uh, I disagree. Could you see a scenario over the next couple of years where uh, the women have been so successful that people start to take them for granted, while all these promising young American men's players do pan out, and the U.S. all of a sudden has an exciting team on the men's side, and because that's the shiny new toy. That's what everybody focuses on. And the women start to feel slighted, like, hey, you're giving them credit for becoming this really good team where we've already been there for all these years. And what, you know, could, could you see that dynamic? I could, but I, I, I envision a world where success from both teams is a good thing, where there is room for the love of both of these teams being successful. We haven't lived in that world because the U.S. team has been, the U.S. women's national team has been so prominent um, and dominating in what they do. W will we take it for granted? Yeah, but that happens with all champions. Um, and that's, that's part, you know, we talked earlier about the U.S. women's national team. That's part of their challenge is while we, we from the outside might take it for granted, once they start taking it for granted, and once they don't continue to get better and to find ways to even get incrementally better individually and collectively, then they're going to lose that. And they're going to lose that type of attention. And it might go back and forth as we go along. But I, I envision a day where both the men's team and the women's national team are successful on the field and are getting all the love and credit that they want and deserve. Uh, next question, interestingly enough, is from a guy named Alex Goldstein, who normally asks me a lot of questions, and he's sort of cheating on me with you because he asked oh. you a question. Um, how would you compare Bruce Arena and Bob Bradley as U.S. men's national team coaches? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I have known and worked with and had as coaches, all of them, in different capacities over the years. Um, they could not be more different as people and as coaches and a lot of it's obvious from the outside i mean if you look at their their personalities they're very very different um there are some similarities and i think they do have at their core a belief in the american player and a belief in the american soccer culture that drives a lot um it manifests in different ways and how they go about it but so now, I mean, if you look at who's better or worse, obviously Bruce Serena is always going to have 2002 and the U.S. men's team doing the best that it ever has at a World Cup. But by the same token, Bruce Serena is also going to have on his resume the epic failure that we just talked about in 2017 of taking over the team and not qualifying the team for the World Cup. Um, and, you know, uh, Bob Bradley you know, has had success and failure with the, uh, with the national team. I don't think that, I, I think it really comes down to, if, if you're making a decision between the two, 
who do you want for your environment? Because both come in and both demand to be seen and heard and both come in and suck the air out of the room in very, very different ways. And by the way, that's not, that's not a bad thing. That's what you want. You want bigger than life type of personalities that come in and say, this is what we are doing. And either you're, you're in or you're not. As I said, they do it in very, very different ways. And so you have to know what your club is or wants to be. And you have to know the personnel within your club and which one is conducive to working that. You know, Bruce Arena is notoriously much more laid back. And when you say that, that doesn't mean he's not competitive and doesn't mean he can't, he can't get, get angry. But he's much more laid back and hands off until he needs to be hands on. Uh, Bob Bradley is, you know, lack for lack of a better word, a little bit more um, strict and militant in what he goes in how he goes about coaching. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't have great relationships and personal type of relationships and doesn't stick up for those players. Um, and he, he would probably be less uh, touchy feely, I guess, in terms of a, a for lack of a better phrase when it comes to, uh, to coaching. So I, you know, I guess it, it's whatever you, it's whatever you think. And when you look at those resumes, I think they, they match up well because that 2002 look, I think that that's going to be the, the differentiation when it comes to the two, but it, it shouldn't necessarily. So anyway, good question. Good question. Uh, and finally, uh, PD blue 10, uh, wants to know Thomas Tuchel taking players off, or Thomas Tuchel taking players off the pitch because he didn't like their attitudes. I call it coaching. What would you call it? Uh, what he's referring to here is uh, this past weekend, Chelsea's game against Southampton. Uh, Tuchel, he brought on Callum Hudson-Odoi at halftime, but then was so unhappy with his performance in the second half that he, he subbed them off in the 70-something minute and was very demonstrative on the bench uh, with how unhappy he was with hudson Adoy, And so a lot of people thought he crossed the line and kind of showed him up and embarrassed a young player and could risk losing him. So it, it did turn into this whole larger debate about coaching methods and all that. So what did you make of it? I, I think a lot of times uh, that coaches, the, the things that they do, the way that they act, uh, even their gesticulations are performative uh, and they are designed to elicit a reaction, uh, oftentimes from the public uh, whether it's the people in the stadium, the people that are watching at home, and at times it's from their players. And like any coach in terms of management, it's one-on-one kind of stuff. You have to know when to kick somebody in the ass and you have to know when to pat somebody on the back. And you have to know which one at which time, but also which one responds differently to, uh, to both of those things. Uh, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't have a problem, but you got to use that, that moment sparingly because... You risk in that moment, for example, losing the player who you are very publicly shaming, if you will. Okay. Uh, and so you risk losing him going forward. You hope that that public shaming is going to elicit a response that is going to benefit the player and therefore your team. You also risk in that moment losing the support of the rest of the players who see you not having that player's back and very publicly uh, putting them in a position where they can be ridiculed. Now, for a new coach, there's even a whole nother calculation as to when you want to play that card. And I think Tuchel kind of, because he's new, I think he can, in a certain way, get away with it more, where it's, there's a new sheriff in town. And these are the rules. And I'm telling you as players, but I'm also sending that message to everybody else that saw that. That was by design. That was strategic. And he will have gone through all of the different things that we just talked about as to the advantages and the, dif and the disadvantage and the benefits uh, that doing something like that have weighing it against the costs uh, over there. So I, I didn't have a problem with it. I know it's embarrassing. I know it's embarrassing for a player to have that happen and what it signifies in the game. But you're also, you have to have a ruthless sense to be a good coach. And if you think things aren't going well and you have the opportunity to do something that is going to affect change in that moment, you should do it. Or if you think that doing it in that moment, it's going to affect a bigger change that is going to benefit you, 
then you should probably think about doing it. But, you know, he, he, he will have, as I said, understood that he possibly by doing that has shot himself in the foot going forward with both the player and even maybe more importantly, because he might not even believe in that player. But if the other players see it and now they check out, then, uh, then you got problems and then you, you know, lose the proverbial locker room and all that. Uh, Christian Pulisic, meanwhile, missed this past weekend's game because of an injury. But even when he's been fit, he hasn't played all that much since Tuchel took charge. Um, and Tuchel was asked about Pulisic's future with the club and was sort of noncommittal about it. He did say nice things about him and said ideally he'd like him to stay, but refused to commit to him staying with the club next season. And so uh, that those quotes have uh, U.S. soccer Twitter in an in yeah. uproar and people worrying about Christian Pulisic's future. Uh, really, the trouble started right around the time that some podcast host said he was too good for Chelsea. And it feels like the <laughs> this is my right fault, away. right? Uh, but uh, is, is this just an overreaction? I mean, where are you and Christian Pulisic right now? No, he may still be too good for this Chelsea team, okay? <laughs> uh, it's just a matter of, is he in the plans or not when it comes to Tuchel? Okay. Which means that he could go someplace else and be absolutely the right fit for wherever that place is. And if he is not in the plans and has the opportunity to, you know, find a better situation, of course he should look at it. Or, you know, he might want to just fight through it. Or maybe he just, he likes living in, uh, in London and he likes playing for Chelsea or not playing for Chelsea. And he's certainly making plenty of money. And he just wants to ride this thing out. Uh, when it comes to Christian Pulisic, and we've talked about this before, his now consistent injuries and problems when it comes to injuries, however big or small they are, they're not allowing him to do what he wants to do and to be in consideration. This has now, this now has to be part of the thinking of, as I said before, any coach that assesses uh, Christian Pulisic. And I wish it wasn't the case. And I wish I could snap my fingers and somehow he would be fit and ready to go. But, you know, that's, that's not happening right now. And um, if he were to change, that would be interesting. Is Christian Pulisic, after what has happened and his, you know, or has his value decreased? And if it has, by how much? And if somebody came calling what would that fee be? What would it look like given that, what did he got transferred? Eight, was it 80 or something like that from, uh, from Dortmund? Something around there. Something around there. I mean, it, I mean it, was a, it was a lot of money. It was a lot of money and it's still a lot of money right now. And would somebody continue to pay that given the fact that he is oftentimes viewed now as damaged goods going forward? I don't, I don't know. But if there is an opportunity uh, to go someplace, and, and more importantly, Tuchel's got to be real honest with him. And then what, it, what he says publicly that, you know, what's he going to say? I hate this player and I don't want him on my team. No, he's not going to say that, even though he may think that. Hopefully they have a come to Jesus type of moment and they figure it out and then they can go their separate ways if they have to. Or if he really is part of the plans, first off, they got to figure out a way to get him healthy. And that's <laughs> that's easier said than done. But at least if you know you're part of the plans, then you can stop worrying about that. Because if you're not part of the plans, it doesn't matter how healthy you are or how good you are for that matter. You're just not part of the plans and you got to go someplace else. I don't know. What do you think, Mossy? The, the, uh, uh, there's no doubting his quality. Uh, the, the injuries to me, that's the big issue. And, and yeah, the, the, the cautionary tale for Pulisic is a player who we've talked about who just signed uh, an MLS, which is Pato. Uh, there's mm. a young guy, super talented, went to AC Milan and showed he was the real deal, but then had a succession of injuries that just caused him to lose momentum. And then he tried to bulk up too much to try to avoid those injuries. And that had a negative effect. And, uh, you know, I mean, we don't have to go down the, the whole Pato rabbit hole again, but in my view, he kind of lost his focus as a player. So I, I hope just the same thing doesn't happen with Pulisic because it, the, the stop start nature of his career right now, it's gotta be frustrating to him. And, you know, all this, all this succession of injuries and, and, you know, especially for a player like him, whose game is built around sort of explosiveness and beating guys, um, you know, by bursting past them. And so uh, that would be the one concern. I mean, the, the health, uh, yeah, his inability to stay healthy, I think is the, the big question mark right now. Well, let's hope he, let's hope he gets healthy. Let's hope he gets healthy. Anything else uh, from an Ask Alexi standpoint, Mossy? That's it. 
All right, we're going to take another quick real uh, break here, and then we'll come back and finish up the show as we always do with my uh, one for the road. All right, we're back, uh, and we've come to the end of yet another pod, another successful pod, I would say. Uh, well, I'm going to say it. Um, you may disagree, but either way, you're listening. So thank you very much for uh, for listening. And at the end of each and every pod, we do one for the road. Uh, this one, uh, I was thinking earlier, uh, and Masi, I'd actually like you to chime in here because I'm interested in your, your opinion here. Uh, my good friends and colleagues over there at MLS at uh, Extra Time Radio, uh, the, uh, the podcast that they do, uh, both audio and, and video, they were uh, discussing last week and I'm going to paraphrase this, and uh, res respectfully, I hope that I'm doing this, this justice. They were talking about how they are giving people, players, teams, and maybe in a sense, leagues, a pass for any type of failure uh, or, you know, or not living up to what we expect of them in 2020. OK, and, you know, we, we've talked before about the the concept of an asterisk existing in feats and successes in 2020. And by the way, it's not just relative to MLS. We could we could apply it to certainly you know, people that have had success, uh, be it a, a Columbus crew, but we could also apply it to, I don't know, a, a, a Bayern Munich or people that have failed. And th this is where that giving a pass um, kind of piqued my interest because when I think about, you know, giving a pass to people that, that, that didn't live up to expectations, chicharitos, uh, I think that was part of the conversation that they were talking about. I get it. I mean, it was a year unlike any of us have ever experienced and a year from a professional standpoint, unlike any other season. Are you, do you think that people that didn't live up to expectations, teams that failed, or leagues that weren't to the level that you, we have expected in quote unquote normal times should be given a pass because of the historic and unique aspects of the world in which we inhabited for the last year? I think you have to look at it on a case by case basis. There are some situations where you definitely feel uh, that the pandemic was the root cause for the, the, the underperforming and others where you kind of come away feeling like, no, there were other factors and it would have happened anyway. Uh, for example, I, I would not give Chicharito a pass for his 2020, but I would certainly give the University of Michigan football team a pass for their season. <laughs> well, I mean, look, the, uh, the uh, the derby that happened over there at uh, at Anfield this week, right? Do you think uh, you know for the first time since what two thousand something or other, Everton went in to Anfield and won, right? I, I'm I'm saying that right, correct? Uh, first time since 1999, yeah, Everton okay. went in there and won. All right. Um, would the result have been the same if? the craziness that exists in that historic derby had gone on, including fans in the stadium. Potentially. Yeah. That is an example where not having those fans, I think is making an enormous difference. Yeah. See, m my point to them was, uh, you know, for a Chicharito or anything like else, I, I think that if, if you're letting them off the hook or giving a pass to people that fail, then, then, then people that succeed, you have to give them a pass in a certain way of succeeding. <laughs> so I, I, I've talked about the asterisk, and I think that as we get further and further away, I think more asterisks are going to be applied. And you know, hopefully as we get back to some sort of semblance of normalcy and we are reintroduced and in a certain way reminded of how different this last year has been because we hear the noises and we see the sights and we recognize the pressure that it's not that we've forgotten it. It's just that it has become distant to us because of time. And we are reminded of that. I think we're going to look at a lot of the, the successes you know, Bayern Munich winning Champions League. All right, yes, they're going to celebrate. But there is going to be more of that. Yes, but it happened at this time. 
And so if you're gonna if you're gonna apply it to someone like Chicharito, then you should apply it to someone like the Columbus crew, in that, all right, we'll give you a pass Chicharito because of the situation that's going on right now. But then you got to say about the Columbus crew, all right, but what you did really wasn't as great. So either it all counts or none of it. Counts. Absolutely, Mossy. That's what <laughs> I'm saying going forward. All right. This is nothing that's going to change your life. This is nothing uh, affirming uh, or, or, or anything mind-blowing that I am talking to you about here on my One for the Road. It was just I was thinking about uh, these things. Uh, and, and look, we thought about them at the time and we continue to think about them. I, it, all of this is to say, I think we will be glad to have this debate and this conversation and throwing asterisks or not throwing asterisks going forward if and when we get back to that to, to, to normal or some semblance of normalcy. Fingers crossed we are heading in the right direction. Uh, there was an announcement today that, uh, that came out of England that 25%, I think, of the stadiums are now going to be allowed to be filled uh, going forward. That's you know a, a step in that direction. But it will be interesting, and I think I'm not. I'm speaking for you and everybody else out there. I can't wait to be reminded uh, and to have that recall of what it sounds like and what it feels like and what it looks like and what it smells like to be back in that environment. And it's going to be very, very interesting to see who, from an on-field perspective, with that return to that environment. How our perceptions of players and of teams and of leagues change. Um, and I can't wait because that will mean that we have headed in the right direction and we are back, as I said, to some semblance of, uh, of normalcy. Um, and I hope we get there as quickly as possible. Hope everybody uh, is staying safe and say, uh, sane out there. Mossy, anything before we go? That's it. All right, we'll be back again next week. Please make sure to uh, check us out on all the different platforms out there and review and subscribe and uh, rate and download and do all the things that you do. Use that hashtag Ask Alexi out there and all different social media platforms uh, that are either in existence or coming up uh, each and every day. I can't keep track of them all. Uh, we, uh, we love hearing all of your comments, uh, whether you agree or whether you disagree with the stuff that we're talking about. We will see you again, same time, same place next week on the State of the Union podcast. And until then, as always, size the day. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.